Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp after a few power outages. Maybe you've been on your phone today trying to post a little something on Instagram and you weren't able to. Well, you're not alone. There was a lot of people who were dealing with this. That's why I want to bring in our very own Michael Santo. He is an economist and an expert when it comes to this type of stuff. Michael, thanks for being on the show. Welcome. So tell me, what kind of runoff is this going to have going into the rest of the week for Facebook? Oh, it's challenging. They were having a tough week as is because of the interview by somebody who worked for Facebook on 60 Minutes, um, revealing internal documents, raising concerns. So this is not a way to make it better for starts. Yeah, so we know all about that. We also know a lot of people operate off of social media right now. We're talking influencers. We're talking small businesses. You know, these people were not able to use the platforms. How big of a hit is that for them? Um, you know, people are used to outages, actually. You know, historically, we've seen this um, with TV stations, which are one of the most uh, old-fashioned, traditional advertising. They've gone down. Or if you bought TV advertising in the old days, if there's an earthquake or war, they go to live news coverage and then you lose all the television advertising. We saw AOL in the 90s at one point have a total failure for about like 24 hours. So historically, when a company has an outage for a day and it's isolated, it doesn't really cause a lasting damage to the brand necessarily or a loss of subscribers and the customers and clients dependent on that firm are able to adapt. They're, you know, um, fortunately 24 hours, they don't switch to another service. They're just down for a day. So, you know, people are resilient to that historically. With that being said, though, it, this is being reported as the worst outage for Facebook since 2019, uh, which took their site off for 24 hours. This one only took it off for about six or seven hours. Um, you know, they dropped, their stock dropped. I was reading 4.9% at close. This is the biggest drop that they had since November of 2020. So it is going to have an effect on the company, right? Well, you know, the stock market does have instant reactions, which are not always predictive of the long term. And they obviously have to do with the flow of money in and out um, on any particular market day. We are seeing a lot of tech stocks under pressure. We're seeing the stock market as a whole under pressure. We're still relatively in the, the time of year when the stock market historically is challenged, September and October both. There are certain seasonal issues. There's a lot of concerns about the global economy, major global supply chain disruptions, the likelihood of the Federal Reserve starting to taper and even raise interest rates. And we're even seeing market rates occasionally appearing to go up. Um, uh, apparently, transient or transitory inflation not being so uh, mm -hmm. transitory, you know, being more long, uh, not as short term as we hope. I, I still don't think it's necessarily going to be a years long problem with inflation. So there's a lot of things going on at the same time. I think the documents about how much Instagram can hurt teenage girls mm -hmm. is a legitimate concern. But I think that one thing that is underappreciated is the flagship Facebook platform is the most robust social networking platform out there. I really believe that. And I believe that they really have it tapped into its full potential. Um, Facebook feels greatly tied to Instagram because it's sort of like social networking uh, crack for the youngest generations. So it has kind of replaced the usage of Facebook for people in their teens and in their 20s. But I don't believe that Instagram is actually as, as robust of an interface as Facebook. I think you can do work there, you can organize parties, you can organize pictures. I, I don't really see anything comparable in Facebook networking, I mean, in social networking that is. And even when you look at Zoom, which 
up until a few months ago was a really, really hot stock and really exploded. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that Facebook can actually do better, even with the messenger that they have built in with or tied to Facebook, hmm. separate from Instagram. So yeah. on the one hand, the Facebook um, uh, you know, corporate leadership feels like they want Instagram. Why? It's a competitor to Facebook. That's probably one of the reasons they bought it. Not entirely legal, but sort of antitrust to take out a company just for taking out a competition. If a competitor like Zoom or Microsoft or Google gets a hold of Instagram, that would be a strategic threat to Facebook. But I think for the Facebook shareholders, they might actually be better off without Instagram because you could monetize the value of Instagram near its peak when it's very, very valuable and get rid of a political hot potato. I don't think that Instagram is necessarily intrinsically evil. I think it's another type of communications system, but intrinsically it encourages, especially women, I mean, uh, you know, uh, and, and people in our society, particularly young teenage girls, to really focus on their image to such an extreme. And we saw this with Facebook pictures too, from the very beginning, nearly going back to 2005. And, you know, that's not always bad. You want, you know, when you have your child's birthday party or you graduate from college or high school or you're playing tennis or you're playing baseball, or you're in the beach, you want to share the pictures. And there's nothing wrong to a certain extent with wanting to look good. And, you know, for women to show off their new dress or guys to show off their new car, Instagram, unlike Facebook, just shows the pictures so fast. And my experience, this is something that I'm probably not the greatest expert on, is that Instagram really focuses on the pictures in isolation of everything else. And you can't do away with pictures. Pictures are integral to Facebook too. But like I said, it's social networking crap. It is one of the biggest political hot potatoes Facebook has to deal with. So I, I think that's one issue. And let me add before I forget, I think that part of the reason probably Facebook had such a serious outage this month is a lot of their employees are not working from office. And because Facebook is also not just a software company, it's also kind of a telecommunications company, it's clear that you've got to have some of your key infrastructure people in the office. And that appears to be one of the issues. And then the resilience of their systems needs to be boosted. And, and this is something that will be very easy for such a great software technology company like Facebook to deal with. Their reports, I think, including the New York Times, which I believe are credible, that employees of Facebook had trouble getting into the office buildings, into the conference rooms, because their lock systems in office were linked to the same systems as the Facebook site and their, you know, basically their cloud computing. And that's bad for resilience. You can't have single point of failure. While you want network administrators, maybe from home, to give somebody access to a new conference room or, you know, people who control the security, to some extent, you have to make sure that your security systems work even when everything else goes down, especially so that your employees can get in. Now, I'm not 100% certain that that went down, but if that did, it will show corporations, not just technology um, corporations or technology focused corporations, that you've got to make sure that your security systems work, that they're resilient, even if they're not totally taking advantage of networks. And I, I think that is also something that is coming up. And so, so basically, Facebook is going to be a stronger and more resilient company, and other corporations will learn from the lessons here. Yeah. So I, I think. It, you know, what doesn't kill you can make you stronger. And I think that Facebook can become stronger from the result of this uh, downing or being down for so long. And I think that hopefully other corporations throughout the world will learn the lessons from today's failure at Facebook. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask you about. I mean, what does this do to consumer confidence moving forward, you think that they're going to be stronger because of this and people should feel more confident that there won't be a hack in the future or anything along those lines? Well, I mean, you know, in terms of hacking, we're dealing with the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, okay. random criminal groups and, and traditional just rogue hackers. Um, 
the resilience of our infrastructure is critical. Um, you know, I mean, there's concerns even in automobiles. We need to make our cars so they cannot be hacked because that's a life and death thing. Um, we have not seen so many catastrophic, deliberate hacking, you know, where it's absolutely catastrophic. Although we, we've seen companies hijack their systems by some hackers. So that has happened also here. This does not appear to the best of my knowledge to be a deliberate hacking. But it falls within making sure that your systems are resilient and also safe from hacking. I don't think that this was hacking, that this was deliberate. I think this is just a mistake. And you know, even NASA unfortunately makes mistakes. There is never any time or situation that you're gonna have no risk. But making your systems more resilient is important. As far as how Facebook uh, maintains the confidence of users, especially businesses, that might be dependent on it, that's messaging, that's public relations, and it's a little bit of a crisis. I think historically, when these kind of systems go down once, and it doesn't happen for years, people quickly forget about it. Um, I think, but this is coming the same week as Instagram allegations, right. and, or actually revelations, I should say, that the actual documents, which Facebook says were taken out of context, it's also been in a difficult election year where Facebook is at, at, in a difficult social time in the United States where Facebook is being blamed for incendiary um, posts or incorrect posts. And what I think that Facebook and the public has to understand is in part, Facebook is a telecommunications company. It's a little bit of a cross between a telephone company and a television station a telephone company that can't stop you from saying anything. In fact, with telephones, if you want to text or call somebody and conspire to commit a criminal act, the telephone company can't stop you. All they can do is with a, a warrant is allow the police or FBI to do a warrant. I think that people need to understand that Facebook is a communication system more than anything else. But also because Facebook has a very robust social networking platform, it is potentially capable of much more. And I think one of the just core obligations of Facebook, even for uh, the benefit of its shareholders, is they've got to make sure that these systems work. Um, there was a bomb threat, unfortunately, against CNN a couple of years ago, and CNN was able within an hour to switch to Atlanta. But people rely on Facebook and Facebook Messenger on, and on WhatsApp and Instagram in a way that they don't on CNN or Fox News. So they have to take that responsibility and create that resilience. And Facebook is a huge company and makes enormous amounts of money. It has extremely capable people running it or else it would not have gotten so big to this point. So they're capable of meeting the challenge. I, I do believe that Facebook will become, can become much stronger as long as the controversy and the image issue of even going down doesn't hurt it. But the potential of Facebook is actually to be much more. And, you know, honestly, from my side, I, I almost think that they should get rid of Instagram, you know, monetize the value of Instagram at its height and not be caught in this distraction. Hmm. It's a hard asset for Facebook to give up. This is just my opinion, of course, because Instagram has such a huge grip right now on the youngest generations. And it's a catch-22. I mean, you can't tell um, teenage girls or teenage boys, for that matter, you know, you can't, you know, you can't show off that six-pack or you can't show off that new bathing suit. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, it's a very challenging thing. And so it's, it's a dilemma. You know, you can't, um, we go through this in high school, but that's almost like telling girls on the beach, you know, you can't. You can't wear a cool bathing suit. You have to. So, you know, we don't want to be too materialistic, too image based, but we can't say to people, you can't care about your image. We, we, we always have that struggle. We've had that struggle for a century. Somehow Instagram magnifies it. It's a headache that Facebook has to deal with because it owns Instagram. It clearly wants to integrate it with the Facebook platform. I almost think it's too big of a uh, headache, even though it's a very, very valuable headache. And they almost should just focus on their core competency. I could be wrong. They certainly may disagree with me. Their big shareholders might disagree with me. But I think that Facebook might actually be more valuable without Instagram, focusing on Facebook and trying to hold on to what's up and hoping that regulators don't force them at some point to divest in that.
Um, Michael, I wanted I wanted to ask you about the other part of this uh, Twitter still being accessible through all of it. Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, tweeting and saying, um, you know, how much when they said that the domain was up for sale, which it's not anymore. But um, this brought a, a lot of conversation in about the fact that Twitter was still able to work uh, when Facebook and Instagram were both out. Well, Twitter actually reflects Facebook's other headache, political discourse, which has become the main thing of Twitter. Twitter can also be used in scientific debates, baseball debates, whatever. Um, we see a former president that Twitter felt uh, compelled to ban. And so Twitter has to deal with this as its core business. And it's a very, very fine edge. And this is the key thing about Twitter, which I think is hard to separate from Twitter's core business is how to decide what is legitimate speech, also decide which tweets to magnify, which tweets not to magnify to other users. And an example, and, and Facebook is facing a lot of pressure on this as well, and sometimes I think too much pressure. To, to, to show how hard this dilemma is, it is actually true that it was always a crazy conspiracy theory that um, COVID, for example, was a Chinese uh, uh, bioweapon. That was always a kooky conspiracy theory. But from the very beginning, I think that most people who are really experts in viruses did wonder, could it have been a lab leak, particularly in Wuhan? And that got mixed in with a crazy extremist kooky conspiracy theory. And Facebook, I think, for example, admitted to censoring that legitimate discussion. Even if it didn't happen, that's a legitimate discussion. Um, Twitter, look, Twitter is very one dimensional in my view. Maybe I'm biased towards Facebook. All you can do on Twitter is tweet. It has, it's, it's expanded how long the tweets can be. It actually, the very nature of tweets only kind of inspire you to, or incentivize you to say something very provocative. It gets emotional reaction, which is one of the main things that Facebook is actually being criticized for. Well, Facebook is moving into um, video networking, like Zoom, or video conferencing. It's moving into, and it's already in messaging. So of course today, Twitter looks good. It was up, Facebook went down, and they're trying, I think it's kind of not nice when you know your competitor falls on his face to make fun of him. It sort of feels like that, it's not nice. I, I honestly, well, okay, I wish I started Twitter because it's worth, you know, uh, $100 billion or whatever. So I, I definitely, uh, Twitter is a very successful company. Um, from my perspective, it seems one dimensional compared to Facebook. I actually have felt for a very long time you could do a lot more with Facebook. It's better for like, if you're watching movies together and the way that people do things, you want to shop together, you could do on Twitter, but I feel like the Facebook uh, platform is more multi-dimensional than Twitter, but there are some people who just love Twitter. They've loved Twitter from the beginning. Um, but unfortunately, I feel like Twitter has often made the news because people have gotten angry at tweets mm. before President Trump. It has been very provocative. And Twitter can be informative, but I'm not sure. It's, it's like a... Um, you know, everything has to be fit into a very, very short tweets. Hmm. And even in terms of a political discourse between left and right, which has turned very hateful both sides, I'm not sure that Twitter encourages the full three dimensional or, you know, full rich debate that, that that's non inflammatory, non divisive. Um, I probably talked myself out of a job from Twitter one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see this as a big competitive advantage for Twitter. And look, Twitter, whether you agree or disagree with their decision to ban former President Trump, God, what a situation. And this yeah. is the core of their business. These kind of Facebook posts are not, Facebook reacted the same, but they got a lot less publicity, good and bad, for that decision. And it's not as core. And let me say in defense of Facebook as well as Twitter, people are getting angry that posts and tweets are very angry. I think there is people are good and bad. It reveals a flaw in human beings. Sometimes it seems like people are looking for news to make them angry. And that sometimes it appears on Facebook and Twitter, people are not looking for 
President Biden did this right, and President Trump did this right, and Democrats and Republicans agree that the world is round, it sometimes seems, and we saw this with emails, we saw this even with faxes, we probably saw this with vicious office gossip by the water cooler, is that people sometimes somehow seek out things that make them angry, that's exaggeration, distorted, and not true. And um, I don't understand why, I'm not a psychologist, but I've seen this on social networking many times, people believe things that don't make sense, whether it's the right or left, actually. And, you know, there's the criticism of Facebook that it's somehow magnifying very, very provocative and sedentary things. And yet, even with emails where there was no algorithms choosing one email over another, people would believe things or even things that they heard from their neighbors. It may predate internet, in fact. That is just horribly inflammatory. And that's happening in Facebook. And that's happening. I mean, look, I interned in Congress in 96. That'll make me sound really old for Republican Congressman John Porter. People took out advertising. All the big politicians are out to tax your television. The reality is they just wanted to auction high definition television. It's virtually a lie. But people believe this random TV commercial that people paid for. And right away, when they said, these politicians are all conspiring to make the United States communist. And I was interning for a Republican congressman, and they were calling me up and yelling at me and saying they didn't want my political BS and my salary. I was unpaid as a student at Western, should go to solving the country's problems. So when, for example, President Bush and President Obama says cynicism is a problem, it is, and it's not Facebook's fault, and it's not Twitter's fault. And I don't think that people are intrinsically bad, but this is what Facebook and Twitter both have to deal with. I think Twitter, by its nature with these tweets, it, it created a lot of the last few years. Yes, Facebook posts too, and you could question how Facebook magnifies some things. But then I get frustrated. I mean, possible, like, in April 2020, when I said COVID was a lab leak. It's plausible. You know, it's not something that is definitely true. It doesn't mean that China is a horrible country, but it's possible. It's a reality that we can't claim isn't true. Those posts may have been hidden by Facebook's algorithms because you start, and this is kind of related to our cancel culture, you start with the fact that the people who kept hatefully saying it's a Chinese bioweapon, well, that doesn't make sense, it's false, it's a kooky conspiracy theory. Suddenly, Facebook and probably Twitter are basic, basically trying to hide if you say it could have been a lab leak. And it, it's like, you know, Facebook and Twitter can create these elaborate mechanisms to decide what's true and false. But look, a lot of the biggest uh, revelations and ideas people thought were ridiculous. Right. So it's like you start with hateful rhetoric, you know, white supremacy, stuff that's promoted by the Chinese or Russians or Iranians, stuff that's anti-Semitic or anti-Black or anti-Hispanic or homophobic. But then it starts to spread out and you say something that's actually true. And, you, you know, that, because, you know, there's like subtleties here and the algorithms or people who are looking for people to be angry at will say no 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 no, you can't say that you're posting to be deleted you have people canceled so it's i i think my take again in my opinion is that facebook is a much more versatile platform in my view than twitter i honestly well, believe that we're yep. just we, <laughs> So, apart, apart from the outages, they are uh, doing well. The uh, conversations are endless when it comes to social media, and we know that social media giants have been in the news quite a bit this week over a bunch of different topics. Uh, but to bring it back in, again, Facebook and Instagram restoring a lot of their access for users at this time, as well as WhatsApp. Slowly but surely, uh, everything is getting back to normal. Uh, economist Michael Santo, thank you so much for being on the show. Facebook stock by the way, I have to say, I don't own Facebook stock right now, just to be clear. No great, incentive. Great to know. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on the show. We'll talk to you soon. You're very, very welcome. You're very welcome. Have a great night. All